right here. I don't know what to do with my phone. Alrighty then, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, this is your host speaking, my name is HockeyBrother underscore one, and thank you for joining us on the show. Um, it looks like today we're just going to be doing the old school format. <coughs> mm, let's see, there we go. The old school format with me up in the corner, uh, while Kenneth does his thing. Actually, no, we'll just use the regular Oracle school format. It's fine. There we go. Is this way? Hold on. What? Ah, that was the old, old school format. Oh, no, that's the newer. The newer kids school format. Weird. Yeah, either way we do it. I am your host, as usual, Harper Brother underscore one, also known as David. My co host is here. Um, he is just indisposed of at the moment. Either way, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to Table Talk Thursday. Episode 78, it's nice to see all of you lovely folks again, we're here to cover the news. So first we're going to start off with this, um, Jamal uh, Khashoggi, Khashoggi, eh, dragged from consulate office, killed and dismembered. Uh, Turkish sources tell MEE they know when and where the missing Saudi journalist last seen entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul was killed. <clears throat> so, uh, Hamal, or Jamal Khashoggi Khashoggi, was dragged from the Consul General's office inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul last Tuesday before he was brutally murdered by two men who cut up his body. Sources close to the investigation have told the Middle East Eye, uh, M.E. Uh, Turk officials say they know when and where the, in the building the veteran Saudi journalist was killed and are considering whether to dig up the Consul General's garden to see whether his remains are buried there. Ooh. Uh, Khashoggi, 59, has been missing since last Tuesday when he entered the consulate to obtain paperwork so he could remarry, and has not been seen since. Saudi officials have strongly denied any involvement in his disappearance and say that he left the consulate soon after arriving. However, they are not presented any evidence uh, to co corroborate uh, their claim and say that video cameras at the consulate were not recording at the time. Uh, here's a quote from someone. Uh, I would like to confirm that Amal is not at the consulate nor in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the consulate and the assembly are working to search for him, the Saudi Consul General Muhammad al Otabi said on Saturday after the consulate was opened to Reuters journalists, or Reuters, Reuters, whatever. <coughs> we are worried about this case. Um, so let me see. They up the current. There are around 22 cars which are registered to the consulate, which between 3 and 4 are of interest to the murder inquiry. One of them left the consulate building at 3.15 p.m. and went several hundred meters to the nearby consul general's home, the source said. And he understands the prosecutor general is now considering whether to dig up the consul general's garden and see whether Khashoggi's remains are buried there. A separate Turkish source told MEE that the consul general has not left his house for the past three days and has canceled Wait, all of his minutes. appointments. Um, Where are we? A source also told him that the Saudis took all the hard drives from the security camera room the consulate with the with them can you hear when me? they left the building. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you just fine. We in the first story? Yeah. And uh and that's about it. So yeah. That's Turkish dude bro was uh reportedly murdered. And all he was doing was going to get a fucking like remarriage certificate. 
That's well, pretty... he's getting a divorce certificate or something, I believe. It said he was getting something to remarry. So, yeah, whichever. Yeah. Whatever, however, however the fuck this works. Uh, come on, Stan. Yeah. Stop being stupid. I need to tighten that. Um... Anyway, so that's pretty much it there. And also, welcome back. This is Rain Death 909. Also, it was Kenneth. He is now here. Yep. So, congratulations. Yes, uh, a crazy story that happened in the modern age just, just not a week ago. Um, there's a lot of speculation around what's happening right here. And as our next story talks about, um, with breaking intelligence, uh, that the uh, U.S. intelligence intercepts uh, report show... Uh, that the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salam ordered the detention of the journalists, ordered that the missing journalists, I should say, be lured into detention. Uh, Khashoggi is actually is a journalist and noted critic of the Saudi royal family. Yes, so it says here, um, Prince Mohammed bin Salam had ordered that Jamal Khashoggi be enticed to Saudi Arabian territory so he could be detained. Um, it shows clear evidence of Saudi official involvement, Saudi's official involvement in Khashoggi's disappearance in the country's consulate. It's also pretty interesting about who they found out um, was also there because. Uh, latest intelligence reports that there was a uh, forensics investigator, a Saudi forensics investigator, and Saudi security services uh, at the who were sent to the consulate. I believe latest reports are showing that um, within the day before this happened, a Saudi plane flew in um, with with a number of people. Were there, and then they left, and then they left that same day, which was the day of Khashoggi's disappearance. So this is a clearly well-oiled machine in an attempt to kill this man. Uh, further to the further interesting is that uh, Turkey is supposedly uh, going to be allowed to send in investigators into the consulate to determine if said. Uh, journalist was killed in which room and what happened because conveniently you know the, the cameras that was right outside the consulate recording the entrance just happened to go off for an indeterminate amount of time so as we get more information about this story we will of course update you um Right now, that's about where things are. Turkey is in an uproar of a Turkish, you know, citizen being killed in their country. Because, because of course, it's also a bit ridiculous that they think that, that if Saudi Arabia thinks they can get away, away with this. Any comment? Hello? Uh, Yes. I swear some days I feel like I'm just talking to myself. Welcome to my life. But yes. It is this and therefore it is. This is truly a bad day for Turkey and therefore the world. <laughs> <coughs> no. Uh, on a legitimate note. It's pretty fucked up and kind of demolishing of, well, I'm guessing, you know, what little... They didn't really have freedom of speech, but... I f I feel like some of their journalists do try to, you know, mm -hmm. do the proper they good. They do try. And they always are getting shit on for it. Just Yeah, also it's like the diplomatic. Because, I mean, they went in. I mean, uh, they're consulate, but still, they killed a Turkish, I mean, a former Saudi Arabian citizen, or still citizen, but a person who had claimed residence in Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of machinations, like... Apparently, it's pretty interesting. I was watching a video today, which I guess I know why it was promoted. But I was watching a video today about diplomatic immunity uh -huh. and how, like, high ranking diplomats who actually have full diplomatic immunity can get away with 
breaking all laws um, because there was a Ven uh, Vienna like convention that basically all countries agreed, or at least most countries agreed, that our journalists can go into these to you know respective nations. And you can't stop, you know, you can't, you know, if we have bad terms or whatever, you can't, like, prosecute them and throw them in jail on their family kind of business. And we will do the same for your diplomats. And basically, that goes, it, it extends as far as murder. Like, a diplomat could theoretically kill a person if they have full diplomatic immunity, and the house, the house nation technically couldn't arrest them and prosecute them. Yep, well, we've talked about that. That's a bit weird. However, the home nation of that diplomat can rescind their immunity, and then they could be prosecuted, or the home nation could prosecute, which has happened in the past. So, it's not unprecedented. Mm, yep. Hell, I was reading in that same video, I was talking about how a... I think it was Nigerian. But basically there was some like Nigerian who was in like the UK. Mm -hmm. And the Nigerians really wanted him back because if he like he did like billions of dollars worth of like fraud and embezzlement or something. So they wanted him. So he so they went in um with a bunch of people and essentially knocked him out and kidnapped him and put him in a crate. And there's an interesting thing that the video also talked about called a diplomatic bag, which is a bag that is that has diplomatic immunity essentially. Like nobody can search it, nobody can touch it. Like whatever contents are in there are in there, and nothing can happen. And all and like and and the bag can be any size. Like there are shipping containers that have been called a diplomatic bag because the rules around it are rather vague. And it's pretty interesting. The only reason that we know about this kidnapping happening was because whenever they tried to get the bag out, or get the crates that the person who was, like, anesthetized in, mm -hmm. um, they weren't actually labeled a diplomatic bag, which then gave the UK police the ability to crack them open and search them. Interesting. So it's pretty really crazy. The kind of shit, like, apparently it happens all the time. Apparently diplomats do, like, fraud... And smuggle drugs and other shit, and oh yeah, nothing can happen to them. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, the thing. It's the, it's a do what I want and get away with it. Like apparently, one of the biggest criminal acts that all diplomats do is uh, parking tickets. They don't pay parking tickets. <laughs> like apparently, like host nation, like it, for like New York, because you know the UN is there. Apparently, all the nations of the world, like collectively, owe New York City like over twenty million dollars. In parking ticket fines. But the city can't do anything about it because they can't be prosecuted or fined. <laughs> it's just pretty interesting. Anyways. Huh. Yeah. Actually, skip the, skip the guitar story. It's not super. Interesting. I will skip your story. What guitar story? Well... Guitar story? Ah, I think I inadvertently Guitar. skipped it and went on to straight to weed, 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 weed. Yep. <coughs> mm, however, apparently there's a new thing. Uh, I don't know, whatever I want to cover it. More than 100 pot shops set to open as Canada legalizes weed. <laughs> ah. Uh, Matt Burnett and his friends used to drive by the vast greenhouse of southern British Columbia and joke about how much weed they could grow there. Years later, it's no joke. The tomato and pepper plants that once filled some of those greenhouses have been replaced with a new cash crop, marijuana. Uh, Barron and other formerly illicit growers are helping cultivate it. The buyers no longer are unlawful dealers or dubious medical dispensaries. It's the Canadian government. On October 17th, Canada becomes the second and largest country with a legal national marijuana marketplace. Uruguay launched illegal sales last year after several years of planning. It's a profound fossil shift uh, promised by Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and fueled by a desire to bring the black market into a regulated tax system after nearly a century of prohibition. 
It also stands in contrast to the United States where the federal government outlaws marijuana, while most states allow medical or recreational use for people 21 and older. Canada's national approach has allowed for unfettered industry banking, uh, inter-province shipments of cannabis, online ordering, post delivery, and billions of dollars in investment. National prohibition I mean, how cool is in the that? U.S. has stifled that greater industry expansion there. It's like, let me just go online on the Amazon weed, and then just order some weed, and it gets delivered tomorrow by the fucking Canadian Post. Right? And so, okay, That's do people still do ship weed and weed products here in America? Because the government yeah. doesn't touch like, there, there are some ways you can ship packages where they can't be searched. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nifty. Are you done with it? Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if I am or not. Interesting. The federal government will tax one dollar per gram, or ten percent, whichever is more, and the feds okay. will keep one fourth of that, and the rest returns to the province. Who can add their own markups. And then consumers also have to pay sales tax. Yep, some provinces have chosen to operate their own stores, like stay around liquor stores in the U.S., while others have okayed private outlets and most relaxing residents grow up to four plants at home. I mean, if you mm. grow your own plants, that's, that's probably the best option. Cool. Just look at that. Maple syrup, CBD infused. Olive oil, CBD infused. Right. It's weird. Interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Mm. I mean, it, this is setting a historic precedent for marijuana legalization. This is no small thing. This is Canada. You know, one of our closest neighbors who we do huge amounts of trade with, which has millions and millions of citizens, and is right on our border. Uruguay, yeah, they're a leader in this because they were the first ones to do it, and it's impressive. And it's a good thing to be proud of for that small South American nation. But this is Canada. Hmm. So this is, this is these last few paragraphs. So I'm read. Living at each Providence decided what's best for communities and their citizens is something that's good, said Jean Mikowski. This Saskatchewan minister who oversees the province's liquor and gaming authority will be able to see if each law is successful or where we can do better in certain areas. British Columbia Safety Minister Mike Farnworth said he learned two primary lessons by visiting Oregon and Washington uh, U.S. states with recreational marijuana. One was not to look at the industry as an immediate cash cow, as it will take time to displace the black market. The other was to start with relatively strict regulations and then loosen them as needed, because it's much harder to tighten them after the fact. Uh, legalized will uh, legalization will be a process more than a date, Farns have said. And October 17th is actually not going to look much different than it does today, he said. There you go. Mm-hmm. And in a breaking shift of news released today, the United States says it will not ban Canadian pot workers. <coughs> hey, folks. <coughs> oh. Uh, so in a Policy change made today by the U.S. Customs and Border Protection now says that Canadians who work in the legal cannabis industry will be free to enter the United States. This is a stunning and major reversal of the position announced in late September when the CBP uh, statement on marijuana legalization says that as marijuana continues to be a controlled substance in the United States, working in or facilitating the proliferation of legal marijuana in the United States uh, could, where it's deemed legal, legal, or in Canada, could affect admissibility to the United States. So this is a big news for Canadians because there were people who were already being affected by this, folks. People who didn't even, like, directly work in, like, an actual shop or greenhouse or transport the material... No, there are people who did, like, web design and, like, graphics and shit. It's like, oh, you d- you says here, you know, you worked for, as a consultant for some marijuana something or another? Bad. We're not, we're not, not allowing you entry. So now, it says, a Canadian citizen working in or facilitating the proliferation of the legal marijuana industry in Canada coming to the United States for reasons unrelated to the marijuana industry, will be generally will generally be admissible to the United States. 
so this is definitely good to see uh, the CBP making this concession because it'd be ridiculous to ban anybody who has used or is near the industry whatsoever. Be insane. Um, so they still caution, however, that Canadians can still be banned at the border for trying to enter for reasons related to the American marijuana industry, which is stupid. It's like, yes, I'm going down here on business to meet with, you know, major American, major, like, Colorado marijuana manufacturer. Uh, banned. <laughs> Banned. Still, very ridiculous. Um, but it is good to see. So, citizens of Canada who work in the weed industry, or use weed, or have seen weed, or marijuana whatsoever, you're pretty okay to go back to come here and come there. Cool. Um, but yeah, good news. Good news in Canada. And good news for America, and that's worth the world. <laughs> good news for Canada, and that's worth the world. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Let's see here. <sighs> All right, so astronauts escape malfunctioning Soyuz rocket. Uh, let's see. This is is this a video play thing? Um, sure. This is a short video about the lift off of the Soyuz MS-10 to the International Space Station, carrying Nick Hague and Alexei Obchinin. Well, thank you. Bobby. Everything proceeding as a. Uh, Intended for today's flight, now just a little over a minute into it, the velocity of the Soyuz is about 1,100 miles per hour. View here of the crew inside the Soyuz now making their way to the International Space Station. Nick Haig there at the top of the screen and Alexei Ochinin at the bottom. Everything looking good, proceeding nominally. Inaudible. Oh. <laughs> and we have the escape tower for the Soyuz now jettisoned. The escape tower now jettisoned. I love how she's so calm about that. Yep. Is it emergency of booster 2 minutes 45 seconds, the uh, emergency, the failure of the booster? Failure of the booster? Yes, yes. Hearing there that uh, there has been uh, an issue with the booster and we're standing by for information as we continue to get it from the Russian flight control team, but everything seems to be fine with the crew. We had good calm with them and they are okay. We'll continue to wait for more information. I want to work at mission control. All right, so yeah, there's that. There you go. <clears throat> so, yes. Um, this is your story, but I'll have a bit of it. Approximately 114 seconds into the flight, uh, the emergency escape system deploys and the crew capsule separates from, from the rocket. Um, yeah, because there was a problem with the booster, apparently. Huh. So the emergency escape system is the little capsule at the top where they were sitting in? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't it? Pretty cool. In which the actual oh, because the actual Soyuz spacecraft is in the tip. That's why. Hmm. Interesting. They descended at a ballistic descent, which apparently means that their capsule was des descended at a much sharper angle than normal, and would have been subjected to a greater g-force. Yeah, which means like it almost so it ejected and did the thing that it that, that it does in Kerbal Space Program when you're going too fast and you uh, explode. Mm -hmm. Kazakhstan. It's weird. Uh, Baikonur. Okay, I know Baikonur. Why is that name so familiar? Anyway. 
in Canada. On to Mexico Beach. <clears throat> On to Mexico Beach. Yes, folks. As you can, as you may know, for our American viewers, uh, Hurricane Michael has just recently ripped through Florida and the Colorado and the uh, Carolinas, who were just recently battered with a. Was it a hurricane or was it a tropical storm at that point? It was a hurricane. Uh, made yeah. life all when it was just shy of a Category 5. Didn't it just no, appear? No, I'm not talking about Hurricane Michael. I'm talking about the other hurricane that just hit the Carolinas. Oh, I don't know. But whatever. The Carolinas have now been battered twice by hurricanes, and they have been devastating. In this case, um, as the story goes, uh, Mexico Beach in Florida, took a direct hit by the hurricane. And as you can see by the pictures here, it has been pretty much severely damaged and wiped out. Literally, even. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. so speaking uh, at the brief this morning, federal officials say it's too early to tell that people followed the evacuation instructions uh, Mexico Beach, however, took the brunt of it, said FEMA Administrator Brock Long. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's probably ground zero. Today, federal officials are focused on resources, on rescues, and assessing the needs for clearing the road. Today's a big day when it comes to helping people, Long said. However, and power is not going to be on for a long time. Mm. So, yeah, this Hurricane Michael made landfall. Wednesday afternoon in Mexico Beach at a Category 4 storm at 155 miles an hour, causing widespread flooding and destruction, Woo. which at this point has been downgraded to a tropical storm. Still, an extremely powerful, devastating uh, hurricane. Right now, the Carolinas, who were just barely uh, getting back into the swing of things, has now been hit again with extreme flooding, high winds, just more damage. Right now, I believe Duke Energy is reporting that 200,000 people are without power, and they don't expect power to be back for many days to even weeks. Well, this is bad news. Yep. Yeah. Uh, as of latest reports, there were two lives lost after a tree fell in a, on a home in Greensboro, Florida, and a child died in Seminole County when a freestanding metal carport was lifted into the air and crashed into her trailer. Well. So currently 350,000 people are reported with no power in South Carolina and Georgia. And some 250,000 are reported between Gulf Power and the city of Tallahassee, with the numbers expected to rise as more information comes in. Cool. So this has just been extremely devastating to Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and Tennessee. Now, I can only hope the folks out there are uh, getting the help and assistance they need from FEMA to help uh, help them rebuild their lives, because uh, right now, they may not have anything to go back to, depending on where they are. I mean, it's pretty crazy that so far inland that it is that it's still a tropical storm. That's what happens. Usually once storms. they get into land, well no, normally once they get into land, they very quickly um, slow down into, from, from hurricanes to tropical storms to depression. I mean this one is still going full, you know, decent speed ahead into uh, Tennessee and uh, North Carolina right now with tropical storm force. I guess probably because it is a bit closer to the coast than the other hurricanes, which hit a bit more inland, like if it hits like New Orleans up uh, north of, you know, through Louisiana. So it's probably maintaining some staying power thanks to it being along the coast. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Alrighty, let's see. <clears throat> ah, yes, fun, fun times. Uh, FBI says man planned to bomb National Mall on Election Day. Federal authorities have charged a New York man with building a 200-pound bomb. Uh, they say he planned to detonate on Election Day on the mall, uh, the National Mall in Washington. Uh, 
let's see, Paul Rosenfeld, 56, of Tappan, was charged Wednesday with unlawfully manufacturing a destructive device and interstate transportation uh, and receipt of an explosive. Wait, what? Only manufacturing of a destructive device and interstate transportation and receipt of an explosive. Ah, okay, there we go. A uh, prosecutor said he planned to use the bomb to kill himself and draw attention to a political system called sortition, in which public officials are chosen randomly rather than elected. Interesting. You know, I gotta say, if there's any way to die, for any reason I should say, that is a dumb way, that is a dumb reason to die for. I don't know. I think uh, proving the Earth is flat is still dumber. Well, that is still dumber, yes. But I don't think flat earthers are bombing places or trying to. I mean, that one dude shot himself in a rocket. That's similar. Yeah, but the only person that would have harmed was himself. You know, versus this person which planned to kill himself. This guy is committed to jihad. Probably injured fight. and killed and multiple other people. Mm. So how many pounds does it say this was? Uh, 200 pounds. Yes. 200. Yes. <clears throat> so, uh... Yeah, no, I'll take a flat earther trying to shoot himself out of with a rocket than, uh, than this guy. <clears throat> it was not immediately clear whether Rosenfeld had an attorney. A message left with the federal public's defenders. <sighs> Office in White Plains, which often represents newly arrested criminal defense, wasn't immediately returned. <clears throat> the FBI raided Rosenfeld's home Tuesday and found a functional bomb in his basement that consisted of black powder inside a, poly a plywood box, according to a criminal complaint. First of all, who the fuck knows it's in there? <clears throat> Second of all, black powder is good. I don't think 200 pounds of black powder in a plywood box would actually do... I mean, it'll still do a lot, but... Mm, it's not like 200 pounds of C4 or something. Yeah, but it's still a bomb. Oh, no, it's still a bomb. It's also a fragmentation bomb, because if mm -hmm. he blows it up in plywood, it will fucking splinter out and in bed and everything around it. Yeah. And especially if you actually put, like, shards of metal or anything else <clears throat> within it as well. Usually nails and stuff. Well, yeah, nails. And I'm talking about as an intentional thing to cause harm. Yes, you put nails and in more. bombs. That's what you do. Yeah, I know, but nails or even BBs, shards of metal. I mean, there's lots you can do. Nails. And na nails are the, the go-to. Because BBs are, sure, they're a deal, but they're more like I don't know, they just cause, like, annoyance, I would think. I don't know. Uh, metal pieces, yes, like metal chunks or something. Yeah. Also, the, if, mm -hmm. if the container's metal, that does happen, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, agents also found empty canisters of, canisters of black powder, often used in firearms and artillery. Hold on, what? <laughs> firearms and artillery? This, does this dude have fucking, like, arty shells? I don't <laughs> Anyway, the FBI said in court filings that Rosefield, after being pulled over on Tuesday, confessed to ordering large quantities of black powder over the internet and having the substance delivered to a location in New Jersey. So, I mean, the FBI <coughs> had to have known, but why would he suddenly can, like, confess to this after being pulled over? Unless he was, like, pulled over by the FBI or something, and he's like, well, you've caught me, guys. All right. Um, so... Uh, Rosenfield took the black powder to New York, constructed smaller explosive devices, and conducted test detonations, according to the criminal complaint. So, did they know about all of this the whole time? Well, I'm sure the FBI is probably, you know, I'm sure they have, well, because, like, um, I believe, like, stores, I know, I know they are for at least for drugs. Um, I don't know, maybe if stores have this policy, but I think if... Uh, at least for like drugs, if uh, say a pharmacy orders a shit ton, a like a shit ton of drugs, mm -hmm. like well over like narcotics, I mean, mm -hmm. like well over what could be expected for a standard pharmacy of, in the area, um, it's supposed to be like automatically flagged, and the FBI is supposed to like investigate. Like the the manufacturers are supposed to be like, hey, this pharmacy is ordering a ton of narcotics, you know, well over the standard for others pharmacies in the area, so there's probably something fishy going on. Yeah, there's, <clears> that, that sort of thing yeah. does happen. But I would imagine, you know, maybe uh, online stores or whatever, wherever you bought it from might have a similar thing. It's like, huh, this one person randomly ordered, you know, hundreds of pounds of uh, black powder. Yeah, I don't that know if that's concerned. necessarily a thing, because it could be a reloader. 
Could be. So, I don't know. But yes. I don't the know. Whole, the I'm just thing. speculating. Anyway. Uh, let's see. William Sweetwater Jr., the assistant director of the FBI's New York field office, said in a statement that Rosenfield intended to detonate a large explosive to kill himself and draw attention to his radical beliefs. It, had he been successful, Rosenfield's original plot could have claimed the lives of innocent bystanders and caused untold destruction. So he said in a statement, Fortunately, his plans were thwarted by the quick action of a concerned citizen and the doesn't work of a host of law enforcement partners in the FBI's Joint uh, Terrorism Task Force. So somebody was following this guy, or something, probably. <clears throat> it just says a concerned citizen. Uh, maybe it was his... Yeah, but it could be anything. Yeah, maybe it was one of his own family members or something. <coughs> family member? Maybe a neighbor? Friend, yeah. Rosenfield had an initial court appearance before a magistrate at a federal courthouse in White Plains on Wednesday afternoon. And that's The it. only thing we do know is that this guy is going to go away for a very long time. Probably. Anyways... On a lighter subject, the Fire Festival organizer has been sentenced to six years in federal prison. So, I'll state this first sentence and then I'll get into what it was. So, the disgraced organizer of the disastrous Fire Music Festival in the Bahamas, an audacious scheme that defrauded investors and left hundreds of ticket buyers stranded on an island was sentenced on Thursday to six years in prison by a federal judge in Manhattan. Good. So, actually it talks about a bit about this here. So, organizer Billy McFarland, 26, was also sentenced for running a sham ticket-selling business, but that fraud was run-of-the-mill uh, compared to the Fire Festival. So, for folks who don't know, the Fire Festival, which had been promoted by the A-list social media influencers, which is just a stupid thing. It but imploded it just as publicity on Instagram and uh, uploaded with it, uh, imploded within publicity on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, McFarland promised an event with luxury accommodation and performances performances by bands like Blink One Eighty Two, but the festival never took place, leaving attendees wandering unfinished sites on the island of Great Eczema. In the box. Hey, it was crazy. Island nice. of Great Eczema. That sounds like a terrible disease, because eczema is a disease. Yeah. No, this was pretty damn crazy. They are like, this is going to be like first class, you know, VIP. You're going to have your own private cabana with luxury food and like wine and crystal and shit. If you buy like the expensive ass VIP tickets. And, you know, we're going to Blink-182 and other popular bands are all going to show up. And then, like, and then it started, and then, like, a few days before, was, uh, people were like, well, what's going on with it? Because, like, they never had a confirmed band list. And then some of the bands were like, hey, we never received our, you know, fee, you know, our bill to show up. Um, so then the bands backed out. But, and then they still kind of kept it going. It was, like, I'm doing a great disservice to the retelling of this. <laughs> but it's pretty funny is that, once they got there, everything was in disarray because, like, the luggage delivered there was just random. And, like, there wasn't, like, any, like, system to keep it. So they were just throwing bags out into the crowd and you had to search for your luggage. And then the private first-class cabanas were, were disaster aid tents that they had gotten and repurposed. <laughs> like the little dome tents kind of deal. Mm -hmm. that's, that's their luxury private cabanas. You know, they didn't have any food, and the food that they gave out to people, which people posted, was just like a shitty cheese sandwich and a piece of lettuce. So, uh, yeah, no, it was a clusterfuck. There were riots and shit was on fire. Literally. And not just because this is a fire festival. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, it, was a dis it was a glorious disaster. Um, yeah, that left a lot of rich, um, kids stranded. Also, on the more human side, it also did leave a lot of people who got, like, really cheap, um, tickets for this event, who spent a lot of money to get to the Bahamas. 
stranded there until the U.S. government had to step in and be like, okay, we'll get these people home. Because the Bahamas were like, the fuck all these people doing out here? Mm. The fuck y'all looking at? Essentially. Um, so, yeah, this is good news. For, this is justice for all those people who are stuck out there. Right. Um, but yes, McFarland pleaded guilty for, to two counts of wire fraud after investigators concluded that he defrauded investors in his company, Fire Media, as well as its subsidiary that had promoted the music festival, resulting in $24 million in losses. He had $24 million. I think you could book a decent, like, music list for $24 million and arrange for catering and shit, you know. Maybe not all of the luxuries, but I think with, for $24 million, you could get a decent amount, provided that you had the tickets expensive, expensive enough <clears throat> oh, no. to recover costs. The ninja kid is going to blow up even further. He's going to be on the Ellen show yeesh tomorrow. Anyway, carry on. Just, just... I, love how, I love how Ellen has just become, you know, like, if it's somebody, like, who's grown big or somebody that's just done something amazing, they have to make an appearance on Ellen. You know, she is just, she has just now become just the place to go. She is the new Oprah Winfrey, company. basically. Yeah. When is she going to do her, like, Christmas giveaway? Come on now. Christmas giveaway, what? I know, I'm saying, because, you know, Oprah used to do that big Christmas giveaway where she gave away tons of shit around Christmas time. Mm-hmm. It's like, when's Ellen going to do that? When can I show up for an Ellen show at Christmas? And just be like, if you look on your chairs, you'll find keys to your brand new cars. <laughs> kind of deal. Yep. Anyways. So, then in July, after he already pleaded guilty to fraud, he pleaded guilty to two more counts of fraud related to another company that he ran while he was out on bail, that sold fake tickets to fashion, music, and sport events, and was said to have cost at least 30 victims a minimum of $150,000. Well. So that's what? So that's, you know, what, four million? Three and a half? Three and a half. In court, uh, McFarlane was wearing... Uh, brown gel garb and blue sneakers who quietly sat in Oh, you are two totally killing it! I love numbers. you! And friends you behind him. You understand that you got 90% above all the stuff saying, I all this stuff and the trust and of outstanding! And I am so proud of you! You are doing yeah, amazing in school! You are totally killing it! I love you! Police, bo- you- uh, Butch Wald uh, pronounced her sentence saying that this is an extremely bitter reality, he said. The judge called McFarlane unique in this court's memory, citing the fact that he committed crimes while out on bail and then lied to federal law enforcement agents about the ticket company's operations during the voluntary meeting. She said the defendant is a serial fraudster and today his fraud, like a circle, has no end. Mr. McFarlane has been dishonest most of his life. (laughs) Well, all right, they are hitting deep with that. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Oh, so here's actually a bit more information about it, about that fire. So apparently the fire's, the festival's website identified the location of its hosting as Fire K, a fictional place that was described as a private island that once belonged to drug lord Pablo Escobar, for which I believe it's further research into it said he had no association. And though all, of, uh, all of actually, though, Mr. McFarland secured some land on Great Eczema just weeks before the festival and hired workers who scrambled to prepare the, for the event. But as ticker, ticket holders arrived, McFarland's plans unraveled, and the festival was cancelled. He also had a celebrity business partner in the fire media, the rapper Ja Rule, who posted on social media that he was heartbroken about the chaos. I've never even heard of that rapper in my life. The only reason I know he exists is because of this. Right? That is the only reason. Right? But I mean, there's a video on this by the Internet Aristocrat that's just fantastic. He just goes through play-by-play, start, middle, and end of it, and it is a just fantastic just retelling of the destruction of Fire K and the Fire Fest. I would definitely recommend anybody who wants a good laugh 
and just to know more about this to go check it out. I was about to start some feuds on the other thing. Anyway, <coughs> so, police in Ohio. Uh, Ohio University student made up anti-LGBT threats. An Ohio University student is charged with making false alarms after she claimed notes were left uh, for her using homophobic references and threatening her life, officials said. Anna Ayers, Ayer, A Ayer, 21, a member of the student, hey, hey, Senate, <laughs> student Senate at the Athens School. Athens, I feel like there should be more than the Athens School of something, but it's just the Athens School, all right. Will appear in court oh, Thursday, yeah. Ohio University Police said. The school's paper, The Post, reported that Ayers said she received three notes in late September and early October. She said they referenced her sexual identity and one threatened her life, The Post reported. But, quote, subsequent investigation by OUPD found that Ayers had placed messages herself prior to reporting them, unquote, police said in a press release Monday. Uh, the Post said Ayers is a senior studying journalism, a member of the Post publishing board, and a previous Post columnist. Uh, making false alarms is a misdemeanor, and that's it. She's really fucked up here. Mm-hmm. The thing is, uh, as a part of the, I think it's a part of the SPJ, <coughs> which is the Society for, like, journalists. I don't remember the full name. Um, but one of the but one of the big things in journalism is that you report the story. You don't become the story. That is a really big deal. Because <coughs> your job as a journalist is to report on what's going on. You report the facts, you know, about the situation, about the story. So she's fucked up because she made herself a story. So she will probably never get a decent job in journalism anywhere. Because they will see this, because they will Google her name. And they will see this that she, as a journalism student, you know, and a member of all these organizations, made up a false story and became her own news. And they were like, we can't touch that. You know, nobody's going to want somebody who lies and make sensationalist stories about themselves to try and gain sympathy or whatever, notoriety. Yeah. And I definitely agree. She just mm -hmm. being, I don't know, weird, just a uh, crying wolf and I don't know. Doing people things, I guess, really. Mm -hmm. Hard to really explain, other than my faith in humanity is already nil. Can it go negative? Let's find out on the next five weeks of shows. Alright. Time for you okay. to cover some cool tech. On to a little bit of tech news. America's first autonomous robot farm replaces humans with incredibly intelligent mis machines. Which I gotta put incredibly intelligent in quotes. Um, so yes, uh, Iron Ox, based in California, aims to improve labor shortages and pressure to produce crops using AI and heavy machinery. That kind of robot kind of thing looks kind of cute. Kind of reminds me of Wally. Right. I, I something <laughs> something tells me this won't hold up very well. Yeah, well we'll see. America's first autonomous robot farm was launched just last week in hopes that AI can remake an industry facing a serious labor shortage and pressure to produce more crops, claiming an ability to grow 30 times more produce than traditional farms on the strength of AI software year-round, uh, on the strength of AI software, year-round soilless hydroponic processes and moving plants as they grow to efficiently use space the San Carlos, California-based company, Ironox, claims to address some of the agricultural industry's biggest challenges. Such challenges have also caught the attention of investors who, made, who have made more than $10 billion in investments last year, and representing a 29% increase from 2016. It looks fucking clean. If this is, if the picture below this story uh, below this paragraph is like a picture of their facilities. That looks fucking futuristic, doesn't it? This thing. Oh yeah, this giant thing. 
Uh, is that the robot? Is it just gonna be moving? I think so. See, I don't, I don't. Yeah. Is, is that any problems? Because like those it are all a... bins and shit. Like that's kind of mm. interesting. Well, I'm sure they probably can't grow corn, but yeah, um, smaller, you know, less tall, you know, shorter growth as uh, vegetables. I'm sure they can grow. So yes, in the 2,000 square foot grow space, leafy greens and herbs are planted in an individual pots housed in a four by eight white grow module which weigh about 800 pounds as you can see i feel like this is going to be the future of uh like farming. space no not even farming but well, space. space too just gonna, Absolutely. well definitely space just gonna fucking shoot one of these off into the moon and be like and then now we have oxygen production and uh no, probably mars <laughs> and, and then now we have food up there so now we can send people up there mm-hmm. um so yes, the autonomous machines do the heavy lifting, farming, and sensing. Angus, uh, which is the which the Iron Ox co-founder Brandon Alexander described as incredibly intelligent and like a self-driving car, is a one thousand pound machine that moves around the farm, sensing and lifting, and transporting grow modules to the processing area. They are a robotic arm, which is also autonomous, <coughs> harvests the plants by gripping the pots. This reduces the damage to the plant itself, which Alexander said was devilishly hard to accomplish, and require developing a way for the machine to recognize plants as such, and then be able to analyze them to see at a sub-millimeter scale. Hmm. The robot arm has four LiDAR sensors and can see in 3D thanks to two cameras, which also allow to identify disease, pests, and abnormalities, according to the company. It's interesting that they still have to worry about pests uh, in this environment. You, you'd think it'd be pretty secured. Or it could be, at least. But it's interesting that they were planning for that. It took, Iron Ox team, it took the Iron Ox team years to develop this level of precision and consistency, according to Alexander. It also distinguishes the robot from other autonomous machines, such as wheat combines, which require no delicacy in harvesting their crops. Both robots contribute to data and are then uh, are in turn controlled by the brain, which is a cloud-based AI software, which tells them when to act. It's, this is pretty interesting to see, you know, because it cuts out, you know, human labor, which is one of the biggest factors in farming, I would imagine, but also the ability for these systems to autonomously take care of these plants. You know, as far as watering, pesticides, control, and such. It's pretty interesting to see, especially if they could roll this out on something like building size, like they do. Like, as people predict will happen during the evil of us. Thanks for the follow, where's Caleb? Um, so, yeah, this is uh, very interesting to see, and I hope we'll hear more from this company in the future to see if this actually succeeds or not. I hope it does. It just sounds really interesting. But I suppose we'll find out more. Next. Alright. Does I have to reload this every time we go in here? Boop, 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 stupid guys. And now we're close, coming in closing out on the show. <clears throat> ah, yes, this is the one we covered earlier. Woman to keep shredded yeah. banks a girl with balloon paintings. Yeah, roll the video on it. I'm going to start thinking of 100, 150, 200,000. I have a vote of 200,000. 300,000, 400,000. Last chance. And 73, 160,000. Yeah, if you could maybe get on the 10 minutes quickly, you can have a second over there. This dude's just laughing. Look at this dude. This dude's just sweating. Yeah. That's a bunch of Zacto knives in there. Mm. Yeah, it's just great to see. Man. It only shredded it halfway. That's probably this. That's probably also an artistic sense to that. Because if you look, it's right. like it is halfway shredded, but it's only the heart that still remains. Right. Ugh. 
That's a really big photo frame. How did nobody figure out that there was a fucking shredder and device in there? How could nobody notice could... there's an electronic, like, a thing in there attached to it? Well, because it's his work, and you don't, you, you know, you probably wouldn't examine this. I mean, you know it's this work, and this is how it's, you know, the frame is built and designed. Most people probably don't think about it. Most people all are probably like, for some reason, Banksy decided to put this whole thing together. And they're probably like, well, we don't question it because you don't question art kind of business. Art is art. Including this, which is also art. Yep, so a uh, woman has bought the Banksy painting for more than one million pounds. We'll keep the artwork despite self-destructing after it sold to auction. Moments after the frame girl with balloon was sold by Sotheby's in London, the camera shut itself. Pest Control, a firm acting on behalf of the elusive artist, has titled the new piece Love is in the Bin. Uh, Sotheby's has confirmed the final price of 1.042 million uh, pounds will be paid in full by the new owner. The European woman who bought the piece, who does not want to be named, said, At first I was shocked, but I realized I would end up with my own piece of art history. Uh, which is true. <clears throat> Moments after the hammer fell to the auction on Friday, alarm sounded as the canvas dropped through a hidden shredder built into the bottom. In an Instagram post, the street artist posted a photo of the moment showing shocked telephone buyers next to the canvas. It still remains unclear how the shutter was activated. If he posts the picture there, he was probably there. Yeah, I mean, or somebody could have sent it to him. Anything's possible. <clears throat> yeah, but look, look at this. He says, going, going, gone. He has to... So the thing is, this has to be programmed with a remote that somebody has to be there for. Yeah, somebody would have had to activate it. Maybe cell phone activation? I... Mm, I don't it know. wouldn't have had to ring. Yeah. All it would have done was just activated it. Yeah, but the timing was too exact. Somebody would still have to be there when this was being sold. Well, somebody could have called it, or he could have been watching it going on live or something. I don't think this was going on live, though. It didn't look like it was well, being Well, there were telephone shows. people. There was, well, I think it might have. Uh, there's so a ton of there's people. There's bidding on the telephone. Right? Yeah, it sends people on phones, cell phones. Yeah. Actually, it says here in the Mexico. And see, the ladies are sitting there on her phone. It's just happening live. And lady turns around. A few years ago, he secretly built this shredder into a frame. Into this frame. So this has been in planning for years in the event, in the case it's ever put up for auction. So this was something that's been there for a very long time. Uh... Hold on, the video showed someone in a hoodie installing the device before another capture saying, in case it was ever put up for auction. Oh, and another Banksy explained why he built the frame. Banksy posted a video of the shredding stunt. Early Banksy painted, partially painted over. Um, Alex Brancic, Sotheby's head of contemporary art, said the auction house was pleased to confirm the sale of the artist's newly titled Love is in the Bin. Uh, the first artwork in history to have been created live during an auction. Ah, oh, man, this is fucking neato burrito. Mm -hmm. I guess. Interesting, though. It says he's a street artist, so he added some street yeah. flair into this, basically. Yeah. Interesting. So does he? Does he ever? Does he have any pictures of his face or anything? No. Ah. He's in, he's you know one of those secret hidden artists in the business. Especially because what he does is also illegal a lot of the times. Yeah, it's just on his I've been watching the video of him making it on his, his Twitter. Mm -hmm. I boy out his face. So it shows video of it outside. Okay. I'm pretty sure he was there. There's multiple the camera angles of the fucking thing. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was in the in here. Him, or he might have just had people there, or he might have just collected videos, you know, from when it happened. Oh, sure. Because a lot of people have video on it, and they would have posted their video in the So it had the beeping thing built into it, too, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting. Yeah, this is the dude who does the random things. Ah, mm -hmm. look at his fucking... Look at the detail in his fucking artwork, though. 
on, yeah, on no, I really like his work. I have a book from him. A book of his artwork about, that he made. It's actually pretty so cool. Although all of this stuff is illegal, but it's still cool. Yeah, I have it. Here's my book. Banksy, Wall in Peace. I kind of want to go do paintings and shit. Look at this one. You know, I really like how snarky he is because it's like, because um, the back quote on the book is from the Metropolitan Police spokesperson mm. who, to quote, said, there's no way you're going to get a quote from us to use on your book cover. <laughs> Dude, I love that. That's uh, that's like my level of fuckery. I need to ascend. Yeah. Banksy, not on Facebook, not on Twitter. Banksy.co.uk. Interesting. All right, so yeah, there's that. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, but a lot of his artwork, it's pretty damn cool, his different pieces that he's made. All right, Just how clever and funny they are. And it's like, it's... It's it's always interesting when when people don't realize who he is and then they cover up the art. Does he <laughs> does he make deals about it? Anyway, no, so he doesn't he doesn't really post them or I guess I don't know whether he posts them on his Instagram or not. But, no, he only has ninety four post total, so I'm guessing that. Yeah, but generally he just you know makes them wherever and people don't really notice. And once they find out, those pieces are usually either. Destroyed by then, or take it. Yeah, it's always pretty interesting to see. Anyways, uh, where are we? On to the next. The woman with the knife? Yep, woman with the knife. Oh, right, woman said she was given a real knife instead of prop. Dab's friend at Haunted House. The video here. Rifle knife in the I don't think the video time. actually is relevant. First of no day. It's not. It's not. It's not. Yes, so a woman who stabbed her friend in the arm said she thought she was playing along with the scene and given a prop knife, according to police report. Tanya Greenfield, 29, told police she and her friends were waiting to enter the Nashville Nightmare haunted house with, with friends. Somebody can't quite particularly, on October 5th, <laughs> when a person she believed to be one of the characters and, and an employee at the venue asked of her friend, James Yochum, Yochum? Yochum. Uh, was bothering her. Believing she was playing along with one of the haunted house scenarios, she said he was. The person then handed Greenfield a knife and said, well, here, stab him, according to a report from Nashville Metropolitan Police. That's pretty weird. They're like, oh, is this person bothering you? Yeah, sure, here's a knife. Kill him. Well, that's right. Thinking the knife was a prop, she continued the gag, then plunging the knife into Yo Yochum's left arm. When she pulled back, she realized there was blood on the knife and a hole in Yochum Yochum's shirt and blood squirting from the victim's left arm. Nashville police responded to the stabbing call, and the victim was taken to Skyline Emergency Hospital. In the report, Greenfield told police that she did, she did not intend to injure her friend, Another witness who reported the stabbing also believed the knife handed to Greenfield as a prop knife. He told police when he heard the person who gave the knife to Greenfield, um, he said he did not realize the knife was that sharp. Police are investigating. Uh, Nashville night. It's a fucking knife. A it's made for stabbing. By the way, here you go. Here's a tip for people. Fucking knives will stab people whether or not they're sharp. Any sort of t stabbing object when, like, used to stab will stab. Now, if it wasn't yeah. sharp and it was used to slash, it probably wouldn't have done anything. But stabbing... would have caused more damage. No, well, slashing, it won't do anything. It'll just be blunt, and it won't actually, like, cut if it's, yeah. if it's whatever. But stabbing always works. Yeah. <clears throat> Pro tip, uh, you know, Japanese swords are meant for stabbing. Most swords are meant for stabbing, and not actually for fucking slashing, because that doesn't actually work. Anyway. Makes sense. Um, anyways, so, like this here, a quote from Nashville Nightmare says, They continue to review the information. We believe that an employee was involved in some way and has been placed on leave until we can determine his involvement. We are going over all of our safety protocols again with all our staff, as the safety and security of all of our patrons is always our main concern. So, yes, folks, don't play with knives just like you don't play with guns. You know, it doesn't matter if you say they're unloaded, it doesn't matter if you think it's dull. They can still harm and... This knife people. is unloaded, I swear. 
it's totally dull, man. This gun couldn't stab through paper. Right. Yeah. Jeez. Just pro tip out there. You know, some common sense. Some common sense goes a long fucking way to not killing your friends, apparently. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> anyway. Well, he's not dead. Just, he's know. not dead yet. <laughs> he's not dead yet. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, this has been us from Table Talk Thursday. We'll be go ahead and sign off. Also, see you in JD. Saw you in chat there a little bit ago. Sorry I missed you. Sorry. Uh, that was six minutes ago, so whatever. We're late in line. It's fine. Everything's fine. And B roll the outro. Boom. Again. Thank you for joining. Um, you can catch us back here on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. CST, where we, uh, me and all my other co-hosts, uh, High Kick, usually run a anime talk show. This next week will be us going over the new anime of the season, um, picking some stuff out, and basically talking about, I guess, what we're going to watch. <laughs> yeah, the season seems kind of low, and I'm not really sure what all we're going to watch, but we're going to watch Goblin Slayer, which is apparently a big deal. I need to get on the hype train, because I'm reading about it. I need to get on the hype train of, about Goblin Slayer and fucking get views out there and get the anime talk show fucking some <laughs> some tread somewhere, apparently. Um, and then you can also catch me here with this guy on Thursdays. It should be between 8 and 8.30. Probably going to push it back between 8.30 and 9 now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, for Table Talk Thursday, uh, which is our weekly news show. And that's really about it. Sometimes things happen between here and there. Uh, you might be able to catch us live with our new speakeasy video are game servers. Huh? So are you going to be around Saturday? No. Okay. Yeah. And uh, beyond that, thank you guys for joining. We'll catch you on the next stream, and have a good night.